Well, I have a real treat today. Uh, in fact, this is something I have waited literally years for because way back in 1999, when I was working as an investment advisor, our offices were in what was called the, or still is called the AGC building. It's a beautiful building right down on Lake Union. And as good fortune would have it, a guy named Paul Hayes pulled his boat. In fact, his boat is called Investor Ship. Uh, and uh, he actually, I found out, offered classes on that boat about how to be a good investor. And I, boy, this is somebody I want to meet. And I did, and we have been friends ever since. And for full disclosure now, because I just, hate conflicts of interest. Paul is an old friend. Uh, he, is he, he is part of the reason I live on Bainbridge Island because he put his stamp of approval on Bainbridge Island when I met him. And he is on our board here at our foundation. So uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Paul Hayes. And Paul, welcome and tell our, our listeners and our viewers, by the way, we have viewers and listeners because this is both a podcast and a YouTube piece. Please tell us a little bit about your background so uh, we'll know why you are qualified to have written a book, Spending Your Way to Wealth. And that's what we're here to talk about. And Paul, we're here to talk about it with you. So tell us about yourself. Well, that's uh, uh, interesting you remember the boat because uh, uh, that was a boat that I acquired right after retiring from a career in the financial industry as a financial advisor with a New York-based uh, financial firm. Uh, and I served clients that were both individuals, corporations, and municipalities. Uh, and at the point in my career, I reached where I no longer needed to work, but I had an abiding interest in the financial industry and saw some things that I thought could be made better or could be made more understandable. Uh, when I retired, I commenced a relationship with a psychologist that was introduced to me at the University of Washington, Ron Smith. And he was introduced to me as one of the most qualified people that this particular individual had knew uh, to deal with financial decision making because Ron's entire career had revolved around being a personality psychologist. He had spent many of his university years also as a sports psychologist mm. working with professional athletic teams who hired him to come in and help the professional athletes perform better, enhanced behavior. And uh, uh, it seemed to me that this was exactly the kind of person that could help me put together something that would resemble a course, that would help people make better financial decisions. So after getting to know him, we hit it off immediately. We put together a body of work uh, and we started putting on seminars for corporations and individuals. Uh, and as you mentioned, they were held on board this vessel, which would seat 10 people comfortably inside a cabin. Uh, and we talked to people about how they could understand their personality uh, and their behavior. And in fact, uh, uh, enhance their performance in investment or financial decisions. And we did that for quite a number of years. Uh, uh, Ron was invited to come back to the University of Washington and head up the uh, clinical psychology program there, which he did. And uh, he also was a prolific textbook writer, wrote numerous textbooks and professional journals that were published uh, by McGraw-Hill. But we stayed in touch over the years. I moved to Bainbridge Island uh, uh, and uh, immediately started putting on some workshops in the high school and in the community, still dealing with personality psychology and how people make financial decisions. Uh, that's when uh, Paul and I met was uh, when he moved to Bainbridge Island and we got really connected and became friends. Uh, but we've both seen eye to eye on so many things. Uh, Paul has a no conflict of interest approach to helping people make financial decisions, which is critical. Uh, and he's an educator, an excellent educator who understands not only his subject, but he understands the people he's talking to. Uh, and so we've seen eye to eye and uh, his avenue is in investment uh, advice or not investment advice, but investment education, uh, investment information. 
And my area of expertise now has morphed into how do you understand the psychology that goes with financial decision making? So that's, uh, that's a little bit about my background. Uh, uh, and that's who I am. Great. That's great, Paul. And, and really, when I saw your original handout material on investorship, and uh, I said, boy, now that is going to be a good book someday. And it took about 20 years, but, you, but you've done it. And I think it's absolutely terrific. And I, I highly recommend it. And we're going to find out why in the next few minutes. And I'm going to save one piece of information to the very end. And it's something I think that Paul hasn't thought about in terms of the value of this book. So we'll, we'll see if I surprise him or not. But let's talk about this book. Talk about that title. Spending your way to wealth. Now, this sounds backwards to me. <laughs> well, let me start by explaining a few words or defining a few words. And I'm going to see an example of some terms. Uh, uh, the definition of wealth, because that shows up in the title of the book. Wealth is an abundance of something of value. It doesn't have to be money. It could be a whole lot of things that have value. We could have a wealth of integrity, a wealth of decency, a wealth of generosity, uh, a wealth of great memories, a wealth of friendship, all kinds of wealth that are worthy, worthy pursuits. We should all strive to have a wealth of some of those valuable uh, mm -hmm. aspects of who we are. And yeah, we need to have a, uh, some level of wealth and financial assets so we can go on doing the things that we want to do in life and need to do. We need to have some level of financial sufficiency, maybe is a better word than wealth. Uh, and spending, uh, terminology there, is an exchange of one thing of value for something else of greater perceived value. Again, nothing in the word spending that denotes money. Although when we hear the title of the book, Spending Your Way to Wealth, we almost think immediately that it must be about money and investing or whatever. And yeah, there's a big component of it, but it's really about acquiring those wealths that are important in life uh, and spending things beyond just money, spending time to get an education, spending time with family, doing the things that are meaningful. So the book has a real broad reach. It's a book that should appeal to anybody that's aspiring to have a really fulfilling life. Uh, and I like to start with an example because the book starts off talking about how normal we are. Uh, and we are normal. Uh, but here's an interesting question to contemplate. Start with a penny and double it every day for 31 days. And how much do you suppose you have at the end of 31 days? Uh, I put on talks on cruise ships, and when I have an audience of people of some size and uh, I ask this question, uh, I just ask the question and people say, well, I don't know, you might have, oh, maybe $500,000. Uh, and somebody else say, no, I think it might be more than, it might be closer to a million, or somebody says, no, that seems high. Well, the answer to the question is $21 million, and uh, I'm not sure you can see that whole slide there. You but, can't, uh, you go out to 27. I will tell you, by the way, Paul, that I posed this question to my six-year-old grandson. And uh, I, I, this is really terrible, but I offered to pay him if he could tell me whether he would take a job for $100 a day or for 30 days or take a penny for the first day and double it every day. And he got out his calculator, doubled it 30 days and said he'd take the he take the 30 day payoff. But, uh, anyway, well, that's a, and good great, for you for having instilled in, good for you for instilling in him the, the thought process of taking the time to consider that because most people's idea is way, way less than the answer. And all it takes there is that 31 columns or 31 rows in a column sheet, just yeah. doubling, starting in a penny, two pennies, four pennies, and right up there to 21 million. But the point of the question is. The answer is so far outside most people's thinking mm -hmm. uh, area that they really can't contemplate something as big as 21 million when you start with a penny. And why is that? Why, why does our mind sort of not allow us to do something that's as simple as multiplying something by two 31 times? Uh, here's another example of how normal we are. I, again, I call this windmill number one because I was putting this presentation on while we're cruising through the Mediterranean in Spain and everybody was thinking about Don Quixote and windmills. Uh, 
but it's analogous to having a lot of windmills rattling around in our brain. Uh, a bat and a ball, it costs a dollar and 10 cents. Uh, you know, pretty straightforward. A bat and a ball costs a dollar and 10 cents. A bat costs a dollar more than the ball. Okay, again, pretty straightforward. So it's a pretty simple mathematic calculation. If you ask how much does a ball cost, it has to cost 10 cents, right? I mean, it's just intuitive. The two together cost a dollar 10 cents. A bat costs a dollar more. The ball has to cost 10 cents. 99% of the time, that's the answer, whether they're prompted to agree with it, or I just ask the question and then shut up and let them answer, it's 10 cents. That's what I guess. Wrong. Yeah. It's absolutely wrong. It cannot cost 10 cents. It costs a nickel. Well, why can't it cost 10 cents? Well, if the bat costs a dollar more than the ball, which the question stated, if the ball costs 10 cents, which is your answer that people come up with, the bat would have to cost a dollar and 10 cents. And if you take a dollar and 10 cent bat and you add a 10 cent ball to it, you have a dollar and 20 cents. But the question started off saying they cost a dollar and 10 cents. So the answer that we all come up with almost instantaneously, we don't think about it, it's so obvious, it's intuitive, that answer is wrong. And, and by the way, that? Paul, I, I, of course, got it wrong the first time as well. And even when I knew the answer, I still had to stop and think about it. It still was counterintuitive. And I, I, you're right. These, there are a lot of these brain tricks. The, trick, the brain plays tricks on us. And unfortunately, sometimes that happens with investing. Well, it does. And we just are so normal when we do this. Uh, I had people on cruise ship that came up to me the next day and said, tell me again how that ball cost five cents. Yeah. Same with you, Paul. <laughs> you know, you think about it. And I dare say people that are listening to this or watching it will have the same question. They'll go back afterwards, try to figure it out. And uh, yeah, you can use algebra to do it. Uh, but you don't need to just, if you know it's not 10 cents, take another number and plug it in and see what you come up with. It costs five cents, the bat costs a dollar more, that makes the bat cost a dollar and five cents, and a dollar and five cent bat, and a five cent ball is a dollar 20, voila. A dollar 10. Uh, yeah, so that, that's just yeah. kind of how we think. And yes. I don't wanna go into And that's all normal, that. you call that normal. I call that normal, and it really is normal, because that's just kind of how we think. Sorry about this. Uh, so what is what is this term normal plus mean? Well, because that's a lot of the book. Well, it is. And if normal means coming up with a 10 cent ball and normal means coming up with an answer that's way less than 21 million. And I have a whole series of questions in the book or not a whole series, but five questions in the book that all are easily answered uh, and all come up with the wrong answer. And why is that? Well, it's because we're normal. We have one head, one brain, two arms, two legs. We're pretty normal in a broad sense. But being normal means we're very prone to making very predictable errors at times. And that's what the book is about. It's being rec helping recognize that we are normal uh, and that being normal means we're almost guaranteed of making some predictable errors unless we can come up with some countermeasures to overcome that normal tendency that we have. And that's what I call normal plus. So normal plus would be a quality that somebody should strive for. Warren Buffett has normal plus qualities, or I call them investorship qualities, qualities that distinguish somebody that's discerning, somebody that will take the time to slow down. Uh, so in this book, I talk a lot about some of the findings of the last uh, uh, 50 years dealing with how people think. And one individual in particular that comes to mind is somebody whose name is not household name, uh, maybe unless you're an economist whose right. his name is familiar, but the name Daniel Kahneman. People don't know who he is, or most people don't. Most people have not read his best-selling book that was published uh, three years after he got a Nobel Prize in economics. This is a psychologist who's the only non-economist to ever get the Nobel Prize in economics. And he did it because he presented enough information and evidence to support how people think that economists unanimously changed their decision-making process to incorporate some of the realities that he introduces. And basically he introduces the concept of people make decisions not just based on reason and rational thinking. People are emotional creatures. People make emotional decisions and those emotions influence and corrode at times our better judgment. So Kahneman's work is a pivotal part of the basis for this book, Spending Your Way to Wealth. And in the last part of the book, the 
the fifth appendix or appendix E is a 20 page summary of that book, Thinking Fast and Slow. And for those that's that don't a, want to take the time deal. to read 500 yeah. pages, that summary will give you some real insights into who you are, or how we think. And uh, it's a great, important part of that book. And it's free in the book. It's just yeah. there. And I didn't write it. It was written by a real scholar who uh, took the time to read the book many, many times uh, at the recommendation of a neurologist uh, and then summarize it in this 20 page summary that is per uh, reprinted by permission. Well, and let's make it very clear. Uh, the, the book by Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow, uh, was, a, was a bestseller amongst people who are interested in that topic. But it's 500 pages long, and it has a lot of it, uh, even people, I think, who are uh, uh, interested in the topic probably didn't get past about halfway through the book and may have ended up missing some really good stuff. But the beautiful thing is about that that uh, 20 page, uh, what I would call like cliff notes of that 500 page book. It is the material out of that book that when we talk about individual investors learning how to be better about the, the kind of biases and the hurdles they have to, to, to clear in order to be a success, it's a terrific read. And, and yes, you didn't read it, but write it, Paul, but you somehow got the rights to, to print it. And I just think that's terrific. But it, as far as I'm concerned, it's two books in one. Well, thank you. It's a good way to look at it. But the, the first part of the book, which is the book I've written, mm -hmm. takes what his subject matter deals with, and it tries to break it down. It talks about some of the things that corrode our judgment. You know, why, why do we make those kinds of mistakes that we just evidenced in the bat and the ball and in that uh, adding up a penny or multiplying a penny? Uh, it's not just because we're normal. It's because there's certain things that we do. You know, why is that? Well, as human beings, we're wired in a certain way. Uh, psychologists have taken the time not only to study that, but to do enormous amounts of research into the brain in terms of how the brain functions. Mm -hmm. It's said we now know twice as much about the brain than we did 10 years ago. That's how much has been learned about how processes uh, and how things are responded to, the, uh, the responses we have to certain stimulus. Uh, but why is that? Well, we have biases, and the book talks a lot about biases. Uh, we have hundreds of biases, or probably hundreds, but uh, I sat down and came up with a list that's uh, enormous. You know, we have uh, uh, some biases that are very conscious. We're aware of them. Uh, we have an awful lot of biases that are very unconscious. We don't really know that we have them or we don't stop to think about the fact that we might have them, which we should, because those biases affect the outcome of our decisions. Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, we have a tendency as people to try to avoid conflict. That's a normal part of our human nature. Uh, cognitive dissonance, I guess, would be the term a psychologist would use. But if we see something or hear something that's that contrary to what we believe, we have a tendency to resist it. We don't want to take it on. We don't want conflict. So we tend to tune out things that are uh, at odds with our conviction or our beliefs. And our uh, beliefs Especially, by the way, especially during an election year. I think that's, <laughs> that's where it's pretty obvious. So what, if, if Paul, if you had to pick one, of those 50 or 100 biases that make it difficult to be a successful investor? What would, what would stick out? Well, it would be more than one, but it would probably be a handful. It's not a, I mean, there's some that you can look at and say, yeah, we all fall victim to these. Uh, uh, not only is cognitive bias, which says we wanna find things that confirm what we already believe, mm -hmm. even if what we believe might be wrong. Uh, you know, Mark Twain had a saying, it isn't what we don't know that gets us in trouble. It's what we know for sure that just ain't so. Right. And uh, we know an awful lot of things that aren't right. But we think we know them and we then turn around and reinforce them by hearing from other people who think the same wrong thoughts or have the wrong opinions. So give, uh, us, a, give us an example in the, in the investment process where that bias hurts us. Well, uh, we hear something uh, and it sounds reasonable. Uh, and so then we hear somebody else say the same thing and it sort of confirms what we heard and what we tended to believe. And we may hear it two or three times and it each confirms it. It just cements it in our mind. 
to the point where somebody comes along with a different point of view and we just, you know, we don't want conflict in our life. You know, we don't want to extend en or expend energy. Uh, we're hardwired to conserve energy. And that means at times we're pretty damn lazy. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have to stop and think hard about something, that's energy consuming. And our hardwire, you know, uh, conserve energy goes back to when we wanted to conserve energy so we could run from a lion that was about to eat us. Uh, you know, so we naturally conserve energy. And that means at times being lazy when we shouldn't be. We need to be able to make quick decisions. At times that can save our life. But at times we don't want to make a quick decision. That 10 cent ball was an example of a quick decision. And we didn't stop long enough to go back and think about it and come up with the fact that it's wrong and it could be made, there's a better answer. Uh, another bias that gets in our way is uh, recency biases. Mm -hmm. We keep hearing something. Uh, advertising industry revolves around the fact that if you can repeat a message to people long enough, eventually it's going to impact them. So you hear the same advertisement over and over. And, uh, Comcast or somebody will give the advertiser a price incentive to run exactly the same ad 10 minutes apart. And you think, yeah, it's the same person hearing the ad. Why do you want it? Because you want to hear it over and over again. And that really does bias our thinking because we recall and we feel more weight to things we've heard often than things that may sound unusual or we haven't heard before at all. And um, you, and Paul, you talk about uh, in the book, uh, this idea, the, the, the difference between, uh, I guess it's again, thinking fast and slow, but the reflexive versus the reflective. Yeah. And, and I think in the book, it makes the point that so many of the investment decisions that we make are more emotionally driven than intellectual driven, but it's hard work to take the intellectual path. Uh, even though historically it has been more profitable. Well, and not only is there recency uh, bias, but there's this uh, bias that comes from having heard it from so many sources. If all these people are saying the same thing, it almost becomes a mob psychology. I mean, mobs will do what an individual won't do. Crowds of people will invest in things that an individual might not otherwise. But if everybody else seems to be doing it, who am I to say that they're wrong? And I, I probably should do the same thing. Well, well I'll give you an talk. example, uh, Paul. At, uh, going back to the late 90s, you and I both remember Janus, the Janus Funds. That name was everywhere. Money Magazine, Best Mutual Fund Family, Janus. Uh, they, they, were, they were hitting great returns. They turned out to be one of the worst performing families in the the bear market of 2000 through 2002 they had funds that had the same thing virtually in every fund and so they had lots of funds that were considered to be amongst the best and they people talked about back in those days that didn't have the internet in the same way that we do now the money came in huge sacks of mail filled with checks for a lot of money because that name became a household name and therefore trustworthy and it cost people billions. Well, we have a tendency to follow trends or give more yeah. uh, credence to a trend than it deserves. And uh, that's an example of it that you just mentioned with the Janus Fund. It happens in mutual funds all the time where a mutual fund will do well for a quarter or a half a year or maybe a couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, and people see that trend and conclude that that trend must be something that's going to continue forever. Remember, uh, Jerry Brown, when he was the governor of California, made mention of the fact that if the population of California continued to grow at the rate it had been growing when he was governor 30 years ago, that uh, within 10 years, 115% of the population of the United States would reside in California oh. because that was where the trend was taking them. Yeah. Well, it couldn't happen. Uh, and, and that's, uh, that's just part of our nature. And it's one of those things we have to be aware of. Uh, and we have to be judicious about it because some trends do tend to continue over time. Some trends that are based on good solid logic and uh, cautious uh, assumptions, those are trends that have a high likelihood of probably continuing. They may not continue unabated forever, 
uh, and they may have periods of time where they tend to fall out of favor and it appears that they're not working. But this is a mutual funds nephesis. People will invest in a fund while it's doing well uh, and then they'll turn around and as soon as it's not doing well, they'll decide it's time to get out. Uh, in the book, I talk about investor behavior and investment behavior and a big distinction between the two because uh, investment performance often will exceed an investor's performance or an investor's return. How can that be? Well, people will invest in a particular mutual fund and uh, hold it uh, while it's doing well. Uh, and then if it starts to look like it may not be continuing to do well, the strategy of the fund may not have changed, but maybe the psychology of the moment for people has changed. And so people will sell that mutual fund maybe at precisely the wrong time. They think that that trend can't continue. Uh, so, so now we're talking about investing, but I want to go back a step because there's the, the spending that you equate, I mean, the spending versus saving, and then there's a word that creeps in there that's a big deal. It's called spilling. And can you tell us about this idea of spilling? Sure. Well, it's a term that probably nobody's heard used before as it relates to money, because I'd never heard of it until I wrote the book. And I thought, you know, nobody likes to spill anything because it's messy. It takes time to clean up. It could be expensive to clean up. And yet applied to money, it's very relevant. It's a good term because spilling money is nothing more than wasting money in a sense. It's uh, spilling money is spending more for something then you need to spend to get exactly the same thing. It could be a service, it could be a product. Uh, and we tend to do it at times because it's so easy to spill money or it's so easy to spend. You know, I'll digress for a minute just to the whole subject of spending because uh, spending is probably the most common financial thing that any of us ever do. Mm -hmm. We spend so much, so often on so many things. Uh, Amazon reports uh, handling uh, 26 million financial transactions a day, 26 wow. million a day. Mm -hmm. And Amazon is said to account for about 6% of aggregate sales. So that says that if you take that 26 million and you factor it up to where it's 100%, Americans are spending about $500 million a day. That's 6,000 transactions a second. That's how fast we spend money. And we do it because it's so easy. We've got money in our pocket. We don't think about it. It may not seem like a lot at the time. So we reach in our pocket and we pull out 350 for a latte and we don't think anything about it. it. Tastes good. We like them. It's sort of soothing. It slows us down. It's kind of a little creature treat, which we need. We need to treat ourselves uh, to things that make us feel good. Uh, you know, but that 350 a day for a latte, if he's put that in the hands of an 18 year old who loves lattes and gets one on the way to school, or maybe he's just graduated. He gets one on his way to work. In fact, he loves lattes so much. He buys uh, one when he comes home from work or from home from school. So he's not spending three fifty a day. He's spending $7 a day. Well, if, if he just cut back and said, I'm just going to have one latte a day, we don't want to do without things that we really enjoy, but we probably don't need two lattes a day. But if you cut back and instead of spending that extra 350 a day, put that 350 a day, which will have aggregated up to about $200,000 of aggregate expenditures during his working career. If you put that 350 a day into an S&P index fund, and I know you talk about funds a lot, Paul, and you believe in them and so do I, S&P index fund is probably just a proxy for the 500 major companies in the country. That guy that spent that extra 350 a day or didn't spend it and put it into the S&P index fund would have three, I'm sorry, $2 million in that S&P index fund when he retired. That's what 350 a day into a S&P index fund would amount to over the course of a working career if it just did in the future what it's done in the past, which is average about 10% a year. Uh, so that little spillage, uh, which is that extra money that got spent over and above what you really needed to, mm -hmm. uh, it can add up to a lot of money. And the book has a lot of examples uh, of that. We can maybe talk about another one if you want. But uh, uh, you know, let me let me ask about. Um, I I think most of us parents and grandparents who are worried about our 
uh, children uh, probably like that term spilling uh, and, and, and we want to stop them from spilling if we can. Do you have any idea how to stop them? Or how, do you have an idea? How would you use your book as a grandparent and a parent yourself? How would you use your book to get these young people to understand that concept of spilling? And of course, that means understanding the concept of investing along with it. Well, unfortunately, it's not easy. I mean, people for years have been saying, you know, you have to spend on yourself first. Uh, uh, and then whatever you haven't spent on yourself for investment purposes, you can go ahead and spend on other things. In other words, invest first and then spend your money later. Uh, that's a hard thing to do. People are not inclined to do it. But there are certain things in life you just have to do if you know what the outcome is likely to be or probably going to be. And putting money into a category where it can increase in value. I call it positive spending and negative spending. 95% uh, of the things we spend money on today will have absolutely zero financial value within a year. Now, Probably wait a minute. I got I to gotta ask about that because I heard you say that uh, on another presentation uh, that you made. And I was thinking, does that 95% include the food they eat and uh, everything that they might buy to, to yes. survive. Yes. So, so that's one reason it's so much is because they need it to survive. Well, uh, and they, I would make a distinction here as I do in the book between needs and wants. Mm -hmm. And that's something psychologists have spent a lot of time thinking about and everybody should think about it because it's important. Uh, you know, you get off uh, work and you're thirsty and you, you, you need a beer. So you go get a beer. Well, if you're thirsty, you don't need a beer. You may want a beer, and maybe you should have a beer. Maybe that's part of what causes you to slow down and be comfortable. This book is not about doing without, but it's about taking the time to think about the difference between wants and needs. You know, how badly does somebody really need a second latte a day? Probably not at all. They probably could be very comfortable if they had something else, maybe a cup of coffee with a little cream in it for a third the price. Uh, but that whole distinction between wants and needs is something everybody can take the time to think about. Uh, uh, Abraham Maslow, the psychologist back in the 40s, uh, wrote a paper. It was called uh, uh, Understanding Human Motivation. And in that study, he put together a pyramid of needs, starting at the bottom with what he called the physiological needs that we have and working up from that. The physiological needs are, yeah, we need water, we need air. We can't live very long without air. We not only need it, we, we want it badly. Uh, and as you move up, then you get up to the, uh, we need friends, we need companionship. Those are psychological needs that we have that aren't quite as essential as water and food or lodging. But, uh, and we need safety, that's moving up on this pyramid. But you get up to the third level and you have this area of self-esteem. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a huge need that we as people have, but it's a need that left unchecked can be the cause of enormous spillage because we have such a need for self-esteem that we spill money on things that will enhance our self-esteem needlessly. We probably don't need a new car every year. We may want one. We may really want to park it out in front of our house so our neighbors can see it because that's going to cause them to think, oh, these guys are really successful. They must be really wealthy. Well, we have a need to appear financially secure, uh, and we allow that need to appear financially secure to drown out our greater need to be financially secure. That money that goes into an investment account and stays there for an extended period of time that's money that we will need in the future. Nobody sees it. Nobody knows about it. We probably shouldn't talk about it because it's not seemly to talk about all the money we've accumulated, but we need to be doing it. Uh, but if you allow your self-esteem to drive your motivation and you do things that showcase what you think is wealth, but maybe it's just a pyramid of debt, uh, you can uh, allow that self-esteem to cause you to spill an awful lot. So going through that list of needs, and then your own list of wants and striking out of that, striking off of that list of wants, some of the things that you want, but you don't have to have immediately. Maybe you want them and you can put them off for a year or two while you park, 
some money uh, to be able to pay for them in cash. Uh, well, but that's fillage and filling wants needs uh, is important. So, so you got you got your normal plus. You've got your spillage. Uh, we've got oh, and I love the idea uh, that we didn't really hit yes yet, and that is this idea that what we consider saving is really spending, but spending for the future. And you make the point so well, we are going to spend every dollar we make. We're gonna put it somewhere. We're either gonna put it in things that, that, that go down in value, or we're going to put it in things that go up in value. Uh, but we are going to spend it all and that we should have a commitment to spending for the future. And is there something you could add to that that would make it uh, uh, complete the whole idea of the saving is spending? Well, I would add to that the fact that uh, if you put spending and savings in the se same sentence, people perceive it as polar opposites. Mm. You know, oh, if I don't spend it, I can save it. And if I put it in savings, I can't spend it. Uh, I look at it like you just said. I look at it, I say, forget that polar opposite aspect of it, because they aren't. We spend everything we have, literally. When mm -hmm. we put that money in the bank, we've spent it. We spent it at the bank, and the bank gave us in exchange for the money we gave them. They give us a piece of paper that evidences that the bank owes us that money back. If we buy treasury bills or treasury notes from the treasury, or we buy a mutual fund or a real estate investment, we get something that shows evidence that we spent money and that we have something to show for the money that's spent. Uh, so I say spend everything, but take a close look at how you allocate that money. Uh, I use Warren Buffett as an example. Warren Buffett is one of the most successful investors, uh, period. Over long periods of time, he has been extremely competent at making good long-term decisions. Uh, and he says his job and, and those, he takes the money and he owns other businesses. That's what he does with the money. That's what Berkshire Hathaway is. It's a holding company for a lot of other businesses. And so Berkshire Hathaway owns all of a lot of businesses and owns some of some businesses. They own parts of Coca-Cola and Geico. I guess they own all of Geico insurance now. They used to own a large part of it. They bought the remaining shares. But the companies that he owns all earn money, or that's the basis on which he makes a decision to buy them. They earn money. And over time, the earnings come back to Berkshire Hathaway or to a shareholder as dividends. That's a distribution of the earnings. And he takes those earnings that, that Berkshire Hathaway receives from all of those companies that are held in the portfolio, and he takes those earnings and he redeploys them and buys other businesses. He says his job as chairman of Berkshire Hathaway is to be an asset allocator. He allocates the earnings of the businesses that he holds as investments. He reallocates those earnings into other businesses that can go on to grow and have more earnings himself. Well, if people would just take that approach and say, I'm gonna spend everything just like Warren Buffett does. He spends those earnings. He may take those earnings and buy treasury bills if he wants to have readily available cash, but he spends the money. He says, I am an asset allocator. We should all be asset allocators and we should focus our time on making sure we're allocating enough money into things that'll be worth more in the future. That's positive spending. Positive spending is spending on something that will have greater future financial value in the future. Negative spending is spending on things that will have zero financial value in the future. We need to have a much greater percentage of our spending spent on things that are positive in nature and that will be worth more in the future. By the way, you do in the book many times suggest investing in the S&P 500. And uh, you bring up Berkshire Hathaway and, and Warren Buffett and what a great investor he has been. Just for the record, uh, over the last 15 years, according to Morningstar, through yesterday or day before, the return of Berkshire Hathaway is virtually the same as the S&P 500, which says that over the last 15 years, you would have made the same return as Warren Buffett. And where does Warren Buffett plan to leave his money uh, other than to charity? 
but to his wife, it goes in the S&P 500, 90%, I believe, with 10% in T-bills to pay the bills. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's even, for, even for Warren Buffett, it's hard to do better than the market, which is fascinating for as smart yeah. uh, as he is and all the people he's surrounded with to help him. Yeah. Well, as people, we don't want to be average. We go out of our way to try to not be average, and we don't consider ourselves average. So the idea of owning an average, a portfolio that is comprised of all of the companies, by definition, or at least the 500, that sounds like it's sort of average. Well, sometimes average is really good. 10% a year over extended periods of time is a wonderful rate of return. So I advocate in the book that anybody and everybody should consider having a holding, not necessarily all of their holding, but having some money in the S&P index fund. And so the book goes out of its way to show how simple it is to invest in an S&P index fund, which is a fund managed by various firms. Lots of companies will have a mutual fund that's basically patterned after the S&P index fund. And they have very, very low fees associated with them, maybe a tenth of 1% a year. Uh, and some of them and most of them are offered with no upfront commissions. So it's a very efficient use of money, something you talk a lot about, Paul. And I think your people that know you know how important that is. You, you have a cadre of people that follow you that are very bright, intuitive people. Uh, and I, I applaud you for, you know, pointing that out to people that, uh, you know, don't just assume that something is going to lose favor and jump out of it in a hurry. Have a diversification. Uh, the book also goes out of its way to point out the importance of having somebody or maybe a group of people that you look to to offer financial assistance. A, a registered financial advisor who's a fiduciary is somebody that can be of enormous help to anybody, then some of the best things they can do is help people sort of buffer themselves from their own natural tendencies, that tendency to jump in and out of things because that's what their neighbors are doing and that seems like the, the, the tactic du jour. Uh, so, so, so Paul, you, you also focus on a, a hugely important topic and that is this tug of war between uh, thinking about short-term risk, the possibility on a short-term basis of, of losing money versus keeping the long-term uh, in the front of mind rather than the back of mind. Can you talk about that, uh, that bias and that risk? Yeah, I talk about it a lot, and I try to point out to people uh, that fallacy that volatility is risk. Uh, it becomes defined as risk by people within the financial industry because stock markets go up and down. Stock markets reflect the uh, the psychology of the moment, the mass psychology that governs people day to day. And so financial markets do go up and down. But over time, the ups exceed the downs and that 10% average return isn't guaranteed every year. But if it's been an average over 50 some years, it's probably got a good enough track record to assume that it's sustainable and may be repeatable in the future. That whole uh, uh, idea of volatility scaring people out uh, is a shame because it causes people to react rather than just staying put. You said something else a minute ago that triggered a thought and I lost the thought. But well, uh, let, me, let me just uh, follow up on this, this concern about short-term loss and volatility. Oh, yes. There's this, this wonderful new Wharton study that tracked uh, tracked 12, I'm sorry, 1.2 million accounts at Vanguard, retirement accounts, uh, tracking them within some 880 different 401k plans. So they had access not to the names of the people, but to the information about what they did. And they broke that in, down into three parts. One part represented the, the, the people who uh, didn't use target date funds at all. They did their own thing. The second group had some target date funds, but they also did some things on their own. And the third group was all target date funds. And this went from 2003 to 2015. And it turned out that the people who use 100% target date funds made 2.7% 
a year better than the people who didn't have any target date funds and were winging it. And then the ones that had some target date funds, they compounded at 1.7% better than the wingers. But what is it that those, those people who were winging it tended to do? They were sitting on lots of cash, lots of something that just promised they'd never lose any money. When, of course, we all know that sitting on cash or bonds is not likely to help you grow your money. But that is about the fear, particularly about young investors. It drives me nuts to know that 30% of millennials don't want to put any equities in their portfolio because they're risky, because they're volatile. And your book makes it very clear. It's not about the short term, it's about the long term. And the volatility disappears when you look at the long term. Well, the whole idea of losing money is uh, uh, something that just is worthy of real consideration. What's the difference between losing money and losing value? If you own something of value, you own a nice home, and let's say it's worth, I don't know, just pull a number out of the air, $750,000. You just bought it, you're proud of it, you thought you got a good value, and over time you're confident it'll prove itself to be not only a great place to live, but probably prove to be a, a worthy place to have some money parked. And the next day after you bought it, somebody knocks on the door and says they were they just were looking at a study that shows that there's an earthquake fault line in Seattle uh, that imperils Bainbridge Island as well. Uh, and that uh, they're willing to buy your house and take on that risk, uh, but they'll only pay you $500,000 for the house. You know, it's a firm offer. They've got cash in their pocket. They're willing to give it to you today for your, if you sell the house, uh, well, uh, if you did, you sustain a loss uh, because you would be selling it for less than you paid for it. If you just said, no, you know, that's, uh, I don't need to take that loss. The value hasn't dropped. The price that you're offering has dropped. But the distinction between price and value is something people don't take time to consider. You're considering it when you say, no, I'm not going to sell you my house for two thirds of what I know it to be worth. Uh, do the same thing with stocks. You know, uh, if the market price of a good portfolio goes down uh, and, and you sell at a lower price than you paid for, yeah, you'll lose some money. If you don't sell, you don't realize that loss. You know, if a football coach wants to win a game, he can't go into the football game and tell his team, listen, by all means, don't ever lose a yard. You know, you'll never play a football game with the thought of winning if you're not willing to risk losing yards. But losing yards is not synonymous with losing, losing the game. You've got to be prepared to lose yards. You've got to be prepared in the financial markets at times to see prices lower than they were the day before. If somebody had had a crystal ball and could have, figured out every year for the last 25 to 50 years, what will be the high water mark for the market this year? Because I want to buy at the absolute high every year uh, in the future. And if they were able to do that, they had that crystal ball and said, today's the day the market said it's all time high for the year. I'm going to plunge. I'm going to buy. If they had done that every year for the last 25 years, they would have made so much money by buying at the high because the highs 25 years ago were so low in relation to the highs today. And does that mean prices today are way overpriced? No, business values have gone up. Society has changed. If you're waiting to buy another $25,000 or, uh, you know, $25,000 house, yep. you know, good luck. Uh, just take a good look at the history that you are, the things you can learn from history. I take an example in the book. I take, 25 years ago, 50 years ago, today, 25 years from now, 50 years from now, I say, okay, 50 years ago, the average house sold for about $32,000. Yeah, $32,000. Uh, 25 years ago, the house sold for uh, about $135,000. Today, that average house is about $330,000. Those are the increments of change over that 25 and 50 year period of time. Take those same increments of change and extend them into the future. That $350,000 house today is going to be worth about uh, 800,000 in 25 years. And it's going to be worth, I think the number is about $2.5 million in 50 years. Just take a look at what history has shown us and take a look at the probability of modest history repeating itself. 
By the uh, way, Paul, I, I, I did look at that table. And just to correct you, it's not 330,000, it's 331. I just want you to know I actually read the book, okay? But, <laughs> but, but I, I saw that 800 and some thousand dollar, what the future value of the house would be. I calculated the compound rate of return for the, you know, from, from 50 years ago till 25 years ago, it was about 7%, I believe. Yes. The following 25 years, it was between three and four, I think. So even, even knowing where we might fall in the inflation question could have a huge, make a huge difference, but it doesn't change the impact of inflation, whatever it might be, 3% or 5%. It, it's a life changer for people who are trying to buy that inflation adjusted cost of living if you haven't done something to save for the future. Now I want to go back to this price versus value because that's a great part of the book. I really like that. Address, if you will, all of these people who were asking me, Paul, how can the market possibly be up for this year? Or why aren't we down 50% with the fact of you know, given the fact that we're in the middle of a pandemic, how can it be that people are willing to pay these prices for these companies? What, when you think of price versus value, what do you think the story is behind the reason that market is basically unchanged? Well, you say unchanged from where it was prior to the pandemic. Yes. Well, I think people have learned a lot from the current environment. A lot of good things, uh, you know, there's some good things that come out of any kind of adversity. One of the things we've all learned is that we are capable of changing our behavior. We've had to change our behavior as a result of the pandemic. We, some of us have less income coming in. If you had a job, maybe people don't have a job. We've been forced to do things, but we've become aware of the fact that we can do it. As resistant and reluctant as we are to change, We've proven that we can change if we need to. And I think what we're seeing people realize is, you know, we're going to come through this. Things are going to get better. I don't know when. Uh, maybe it'll get worse before it gets better. But when it gets better, it's going to be a whole lot better. And it'll probably be better than it's ever been in the past. You know, five years, 10 years from now, the likelihood is that the market's going to be a lot higher than it was at the start of the pandemic. Uh, it'll probably be a lot higher than it is now. And I think you're seeing a growing awareness, maybe more thought going into decisions today because it, some of the decisions require more thought. As Kahneman so, says, slow down, you know, slow down and think things through. So and is that a matter, that, Paul, then, do you think, of the price versus value? I mean, people see the long-term value of owning these companies, even if the price today isn't what they wish it would be because if they're buying, they wish it would be lower in theory, but that they're there for the long-term value. It, it, it is, I don't really know for sure what it is. There are lots of lists of reasons the market is held. And by the way, a lot of the market hasn't held at all, but it's down significantly. So that's another part of this whole process that is a challenge for investors because some stocks are doing well and some aren't doing so well, but this is the way investing is. And that's part of that volatility that you talk about versus the long-term return. So let's talk about Kahneman's work, if we can, for a few minutes. Sure. Because I, I, I think that that final 20 pages uh, is, is, is worth a lot uh, to investors who don't want to take the time to read the 500-page book. Um, t tell me how you think people could use that information in be it being a better investor. Well, one of the real benefits of Kahneman's thinking is its relative simplicity. Mm -hmm. Here's a man who wrote 500 pages about the psychology dealing with financial decisions uh, under uh, extreme examples of pressure. Uh, he talks about the kind of uh, uh, decisions people make if they're confronted with a loss uh, or with a gain. And interesting that uh, a decline of a certain magnitude will trigger one kind of response 
uh, and the intensity of the response if they're making a decision when things are depressed will be different. They'll like a higher risk decision than if things are higher. But I, I, I think the benefit of Kahneman is keep it simple. You know, yeah, I've got videotapes of him and uh, one of them that I show uh, in a presentation is just a summation where it's about a 10 second video and he's basically saying, really about all we have, we can say to people is just slow down. You know, stop trying to make things complicated. We have a natural tendency as human beings to try to solve puzzles and to make things complicated. And we can make investing horribly complicated to the point where the probability of an error becomes greater and greater. Just slow down and uh, uh, don't allow your natural tendencies to make things complicated. I saw this over and over again in my financial career where I'd be dealing with people who reached that point in time where they were retiring and they had their monies in their retirement plan and now for the first time, they could take control of it. You know, people want to control. They could take control of their money and they could roll it into a self-directed IRA. Mm -hmm. And they would. And, uh, but the thought that they now had control, but they also had time. They never had time when they were working. They were too busy earning a living and just letting the money build up in their retirement plan. Now they had the luxury of time. And they watch CNBC or they read the newspaper and they see how these so-called experts, uh, and now they see all these experts that, come on CNBC and the, the, the moderator says, you know, you were on six months ago and you were recommending such and such and so-and-so. And today it's down uh, 20% from where you said people should be investing in it. And so people look at it and think, God, these experts aren't all that, they're not so good. I can do better than that. So now people take control of it and they start trying to manage their money. And they think somehow that the key is to spend a whole lot of time studying things, uh, trying to figure out what earnings are going to be. Uh, and all of a sudden, they're making way more decisions than they need to be. They're exposing themselves to greater and greater probabilities of errors. Uh, and their performance suffers. They don't do as well when they're managing that portfolio themselves than when they just had it kind of building automatically. Uh, well, that it's kind of part of your question. Yeah, no, I think that's, and, and it, I think people who will take the time to read through those will see a lot about themselves. I certainly saw a lot about myself, my fears, my, my desire uh, not to lose, uh, loss aversion. That's a really big deal for those of us who deal with any scarcity issues which is why when I feel like we're spending too much money, even though I know we can afford it, I still get these, these rushes of, of, uh, of scarcity uh, a concern. So uh, I just can't recommend this book any more highly, Paul. And I, and I want to encourage people to do this. You offer a, f a free chapter of, out of the book. Now, is that on your website or is that at Amazon or should we put that on? Now, let's keep, look, I could put it on our website if you want us to do it that way, but it's on your website? It's on the website. The term investorship is a word that we coined 20 some years ago. It's yeah. a word that's basically an adjective describing a successful financial decision maker, but investorship.com will take you to where you can read more about the book, you can order the book, uh, uh, or I'd love to have you put that link to the webpage up on your webpage. We'll do that, that we'll do that, here. yep. And and now this is gonna maybe, I, I didn't ask for permission to ask this question, but when you made the presentation to the people here on Bainbridge, uh, you offered an opportunity for them to buy three books, I think, uh, three copies, and you offered a special price. Uh, if you say no to this, we can cut this out of the presentation, okay? If you say yes, we're leaving it in. But, but talk about that, because this is a book that if you got a couple of kids or grandkids, they ought to have a copy of it, and the, and the price you offered, I just thought was super. So, are you up for it or do we have to cut this out of the presentation? No, I hope you'll put it in there because uh, uh, this book is now starting to be used in some schools and uh, 
uh, make presentations at conference, educator conferences, or they want to get the book. And so I've put together what I call an educator's edition. And it's basically uh, on three or more books, they're $10 each plus a minor shipping and handling cost. Yeah. Uh, but I think anybody that is listening to this video or is on your webpage, you're an educator. Everybody you're talking to is an educator. They have people they can educate. And hopefully your message gets amplified amongst uh, other people, but uh, people you're talking to tell other people tune in. Uh, but uh, anybody that tunes into your webpage, I would consider to be an educator, whether they're a formal educator in a school or they're a grandparent or a parent and they're trying to educate people they love or friends or it. So that offer, if you go to the webpage, there'll be a, an easy link that'll say educator special. Click on that and it'll take you directly to where you can order the books. Uh, Three or more copies, $10 each, plus shipping and handling, which is minor. Uh, I had one person that I sent a copy of the book to who's a financial advisor, interestingly enough. Uh, and uh, he got the book, called me back. He called me. I didn't call him. He said, I want to order a large quantity of books because I want to give it to all of my clients. I want to give it to all the people I wish were clients. And I also want to give it to all the teachers in the school where I'm a member of the school board. And I think every teacher should have it. So he bought the copies of the books to gift to those people. That's great. And uh, the people that I've talked to that are friends and people that have called me after they bought the book, uh, I'm finding that people are calling back buying more copies because they want to give it to somebody. So my hope is that this sort of becomes a, a best possible gift that people can look at and say, I got a whole lot of people I'd like to give a copy of this book to and make it available to them at a price. They're an educator. They can buy it at basically half price uh, and buy it directly from the publisher. Uh, so feel free to extend That's that great. offer. Okay. I'm leaving it in, Paul. But now I want to I want to talk about a way to use this book that I think could be a life changer because uh, I know that most young people get caught up in some of these very biases that Kahneman talks about and uh, they kind of trick us into making coming to conclusions that are really based on a myth rather than what we would call a fact. And here's the thing we need to understand. When you read through all of those biases, and it only takes, it's 20 pages of information out of Kahneman's, it's a, it's a condensed version of Kahneman's work. I got to thinking, these problems that people have, almost all of us have these, but we are an individual investor trying to figure out, oftentimes looking for guidance from somebody we think is working in our best interest. But I, I want everybody to understand, everybody in the financial community, everybody on Wall Street, they have those very same weaknesses, those very same biases. And my concern is, is that my child or my grandchild ends up in the hands, well, they have their own biases. Hopefully I've been able to talk them out of them, but that they end up in the hands of somebody who is also tainted by those biases. And that's the worst of all worlds to have two people who are struggling dealing with these biases, except that advisor could come with a commission from the transaction. And I just think it will be so valuable if we can get people in their 20s just to read that 20 pages so they understand not just the, the, the things they struggle with, but what the people who are probably trying to help them are struggling with. And that could be a costly experience if those people haven't figured it out as well. So I don't know if you approve of that, that train of thought, Paul, but that came to me as I was thinking this morning about this uh, conversation. So uh, the, there you go. Well, I, I agree with your whole premise there. And that is that, uh, you know, people do fall victim to people that have similar biases or biases that are contrary to the interest of the person they're trying to uh, rely on. Uh, one of the purposes of the book is to give people confidence in themselves. Yeah. 
Yes. Uh, a, a confidence to make simple, meaningful, uncomplicated choices, which uh, this whole idea that something has to be complicated to be good is a false notion. It's a notion that in part is spread by some of those people you're talking about who are trying to talk somebody into doing business with them because, you know, they, uh, they're going to make some money off of them. So they're going to make things sound complicated. And people listen to them and think, man, I can't do this by myself. I don't understand all the terms. and I must need to understand those terms if I'm going to be successful. You don't. And you probably shouldn't even try to understand them. Turn off that noise, as I call it. That's distractions, those things that will rob you of the self-confidence that you can have in yourself. If you'll just take the time to reason things through, do some smart things, and then follow through and just keep doing them. You don't have to keep doing one thing this year and something else another year. The key to success is to keep doing a few smart things. I'll leave on a note here a conversation I had with the person that wrote the foreword in my book, mm. who just is retiring from the university as a full-time professor and author of numerous textbooks through McGraw-Hill. Uh, he retired, we got to know each other 25 years ago. Uh, he had started his career at Princeton and he had an opportunity to put money into his investment account when he started teaching 60 some years ago. Mm. Uh, he put half of it into stocks, half of it into bonds through mutual funds, through TIA CREF, I think was the choice that they had in that pension plan. And he continued to do that all through his career. When we got to know each other 25 years ago, he was thrilled by the fact that now he knew somebody who was a vice president of a major financial firm, and I could give him some insights that would be meaningful, and he could start to really tune in on the, on the fine tuning that he felt he needed to do. And he asked me, what should he be doing? And my advice to him was, just keep doing what you're doing. You're putting 10% of your salary into that retirement plan every year. You're allocating part of it into stock, part of it into bonds. You're not trying to do anything other than what you do so well. You're a brilliant professor. You write textbooks that are read in all of the English speaking universities in the world. Keep doing what you're doing. We talked last Friday, three days ago, and he's now retiring from the university and he was wanting to have some clarity and better understanding of his choices as he withdrew the money from his university plan and rolled it into a self-directed IRA. And he was being guided by a certified financial planner at a major firm, good person, solid evidence of competence. And he wanted to know, was he doing the right thing? And I said, Ron, you're a poster boy for having done so much right. Just keep doing what you're doing. You're relying on somebody that's reliable. They're making suggestions to you that you've asked me to look at. They're good suggestions. They're consistent with the continuation of all the things you've done. You know, there's a reason you're a multimillionaire today. And it's because you did things so simply, you just kept doing them. And it worked in spades. My hope is that when that money goes from you to your kids, next generation, they'll inherit some of the wisdom that you've demonstrated of having and that your real legacy to them isn't going to be just a large uh, stipend in terms of a inheritance. It's going to be the lessons of what you can do so well if you just keep things simple and just point yourself in the direction of a successful career. So that's my advice to any young person. It's also my advice to any grandparent that's trying to counsel what they hope their grandkids or kids will take on or do. So. That's great. That's great, Paul. And, and, and as long as I get the educator's price, put me down for 10, okay? I'm gotcha. gonna find I, I heard you. 10,000 books are coming your way, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to I wanna ask our listeners, our viewers, to do me a favor, because some of you will, in fact, buy the book. And, and, and I want to know from you. Please email me. Tell me what you learned from the book that you thought uh, made it worthwhile because uh, I, I want some feedback. I, this is a very good friend of mine, somebody who I have a high degree of trust for his his guidance, and uh, and and of course, you know that's a risk when you trust somebody that's a good friend. And so uh, I would like to hear from you. Did you find that good stuff in that book? Let me know. And uh, and and Paul. All the best. I've waited for years for you to write this book. I'm, I'm really proud of you and happy for you. And all the best uh, to you. And now this means you can spend some time with your wife again. That's <laughs> I great. Will. I'll look <laughs> forward right. to spending time with you and yours. So uh, thanks, thanks, thanks for inviting me. Thank you, my friend. All the best. Thanks, Paul.
Okay. Now, um, I just I want to pause. 